Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. It is an <coughs> enormous pleasure for me uh, to be here today. In reality, uh, to all of us at uh, FGV IBRI, it is an honor to have here these three most distinguished speakers offering their views on financial regulation in Europe and in Brazil. <coughs> the speakers today are two central bank directors, Dr. Andreas Dombret, a member of the executive board of the Deutsche Bundesbank, with the responsibility for banking and financial supervision, Dr. Otávio Damaso, director of Banco Central do Brasil, responsible for regulation, and the former Minister of Finance of Brazil, Dr. Marcílio Marques Moreira. As you all know, economists rarely agree. However, uh, there seems to exist a large consensus around the idea that financial regulation was inadequate in the years that preceded the great financial cri crisis in several parts of the world. Financial institutions leveraged too much and ran excessive risks of different sorts, especially in what refers to the mismatching of their books. Many argue that monetary policymakers largely contributed to the emergence of the crisis, to the extent that they lowered interest rates too much, giving further impulse to excessive borrowing and lending. My personal view on this is that on both sides of the Atlantic, monetary policymakers somehow realized the working of some structural changes affecting desired savings and desired investments, particularly in the developed world, important enough to provoke the decline of the so-called equilibrium real interest rate. Such a phenomenon would have reinforced the trade-off between financial stability on the one hand and economic performance on the other, forcing the central banks to make a choice. Anyway, it's pointless here to expand this argument further. What really matters here is that the authorities in charge of regulation since the end of the last decade had to face the enormous challenge of amending the system with the purpose of making it less crisis prone. More recently, a new challenge, challenge came up regarding how to deal with the advance of technology in the financial world. Brazil seems to be in the early stages of this process, where it is, I suppose, Germany is probably in a more advanced stage. There may be room, I imagine, for us to learn with the German experience. To give their views on the German and the Brazilian, on how the German and the Brazilian authorities have been facing those challenges, we have here Dr. Dombret and Dr. Damaso, Dr. Marcelo Moreira, former Brazilian ambassador to the US, former Minister of Finance, and for almost 20 years, vice president and member of the board of Unibanco, will make comments on the director's presentations. On behalf of the Center for Economic Studies and, uh, and of the FGV IBRI and more generally, I welcome you and the speakers to this very promising event. Dr. Damaso will speak first, then we'll have uh, Dr. Dombret and then Dr. Mar Marcilio. We shall take, uh, we shall open for questions uh, in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Senna, uh, and thank you, Wagner Ardeu, for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, it is my honor to participate in this seminar with my colleague Andreas Dombre, my colleague from International Forums, and Minister Marcelo Max Moreira. Uh, good morning, all members here. Uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to address a few remarks on regulatory challenges faced by Central Bank of Brazil to this audience. 
I could speak for a long time about challenges we are facing, but we must choose one, it is efficiency. The main question for us regulator is, how does regulation can contribute to efficient improvement without compromising the robustness of institutions and the stability of the financial system? We at the Central Bank of Brazil have been choosing two ways that are intrinsically related to efficiency. First, the proportionality of prudential regulation, and the second, supporting financial innovation. In my speech today, I will cover both two topics, beginning with the regulatory proportionality. Yeah. The basic idea of the proportionality of prudential regulation is that the regulatory burden borne by each entity should be related to the risk it poses to others. More generally speaking, I should be proportional to its potential to generate negative externalities. Regulatory proportionality is particularly relevant in Brazil, given the diversity of our financial system. Just to illustrate this point, total assets of individual financial institutions in Brazil range from a few million to figures well over one trillion million reais. One trillion reais. Diversity um, manifests itself in other dimensions as well. Different business models and risk profiles of banks and non-banks cater to specific needs of their customers and market niches. In face of these characteristics of, of the Brazilian financial system, how has prudential regulation involved? Since the first implementation of the Basel Accord, the so-called Basel I, in the mid-90s, all the way to the global financial crisis, virtually the entire Brazilian financial system had to comply with international standards. However, the global regulatory landscape changed significantly in the wake of the global financial crisis. In fact, one of the main features of the post-crisis regulatory response is the rise of regulation complexity. In the quest to avoid the excess that led to this crisis, the rationale for regulation shift to rely more on risk sensitive standards. We we'll, uh, welcome that change because it fosters better risk management and leads to more sustainable business practices. On the other hand, implementation of risk sensitive requirements by financial institutions demands better, more granular and timely data running on more integrated system. The outcome of that one-size-fits-all approach to regulation is straightforward. Tough we had to acknowledge that many did not see it coming. Higher regulation complexity implies higher compliance burden to all institutions. However, economies of scope and scale enable large banks to, to dilute the direct and indirect costs. Smaller institutions could not achieve that and sustain the disproportional cost just comply with regulation. As a result, the new standard did not truly benefit smaller and simple, simple financial institutions as they operate in such a simple mode that compliance costs would exceed any benefits the new standard might entail. In fact, applying this standard uniformly across all financial institutions may even give rise to the so-called too small to seed. As smaller and si simpler financial institutions would be held back by regulation designed for global banks. In order to achieve proportionality, the Central Bank of Brazil has adopted a size-based criteria to allocate similar financial institutions into five segments. 
Each segment, in turn, is associated with a specific set of regulatory requirements. In my view, it is a sensible approach once it is simple, more stable, and inhibits arbitrage. The list of institutions in each segment is publicly available on the central bank website. It is also transparent to supervisors and perhaps more important to market participants. Our goal is to remain fully compliant with global standards while promoting a more balanced regulation. In other words, we aim to eliminate excessive regulatory costs where it is not necessary, while in preserving the incentives for all institutions, all financial institutions, to behave prudently. Please allow me to elaborate a bit more on three aspects of the Brazilian approach to segmentation. Firstly, how we define the segments. This assessment of segments is based on three factors, the size, international activity, and risk profile of each institution. From the outset, we adopt our overreaching principle. The applicability of prudential requirements should not be based on an entity legal status, example, bank versus non-bank. Rather, applicability is based upon to the functions as entity performs within the financial system, its risk, risk profile and its potential to negative externalities to the domestic and global financial system. With that in mind, the central bank established clear, objective and transparent segmentation rules to determine the proportionality of the regulatory burden according to a regulated entity size, international activity and risk profile. The size is measured in total exposure as percentage of GDP. Measuring size is the manner ensures that the regulatory stringence is commensurate with in the institution's systemic footprint. By having a segment thresholds linked to GDP rather than fixed in monetary terms, the central bank relieves itself from recalibrating them periodically. International activity. As for international activity, it is also important to ensure a level playing field. Banks with consolidated foreign assets in excess of 10 billion US dollars are considered to be international activity. This threshold captures approximately 95% of the Brazilian bank's cross-border activity. The risk profile is determined by self-assessment. Non-bank financial institutions that voluntarily refrain from conducting complex operations such as derivative trading may be eligible to comply with a lighter regulation. The incentives are such to keep regulated entity honest in the representation of their risk profile. A truly simple institution needs to adhere to a contract which enables it to comply with a more suitable regulation. A more complex institution would not be able to adhere to that contract without missing out the ability to conduct those complex operations that are often instrumental to its business plan. The second aspect of the Brazilian approach to segmentation I would like to discuss is how segmentation criteria translate into actual segment attribution. We divide the Brazilian financial system into five segments. The first segment, called S1, includes Brazilian DC, domestic system with important banks, which are banks with total exposure in excess of 10% of the GDP, and also those banks that are considered to be international, internationally activity. The last segment, called S5, includes non-bank financial institution that are both smaller than 0.1% of GDP 
and have a simplified risk profile. The attribution of a particular segment relies on the characteristics of the institution itself, not on market-wide consideration. The size, the international activity, and the risk profile assessments are determining for each institution separately. This feature empowers institutions to decide strategically on the level of regulatory intensity with a corresponding consequence on the externalities it could cause. The third and the final aspect of our approach to segmentation is how we keep regulatory arbitrage at bay. This is an issue that the central bank has thought through very carefully. The framework addresses these issues two ways. First, the assessment of the segmentation criteria is done at a consolidated level, meaning that institutions cannot shift risk-take activities to smaller entities within conglomerate only to benefit from a simpler regulation. Second, the supervisor has the power to attribute a different segment to an entity if he or she deems it appropriate, considering its actual risk profile. Uh, I hope to have uh, succeeded in explaining our approach to segmentation. Now, what exactly are the expected benefits of the proportional regulation? <laughs> More competition in provision of financial services. This is the answer. A more balanced regulatory burden empowers smaller and simple financial institutions to compete without compromising their financial soundness. Regulatory proportionality also promotes higher contestability in the financial system by lowering barriers to enter in a consistent manner. Any simple institution be it incumbent or newcomer, it is subject to the same set of rules. Another benefit is that the regulatory process is streamlined. Prior to the adoption of segmentation and proportionality, new pieces of regulations considered too complex would require the central bank to establish its own specific scope of application. Now, the regulatory process follows a new process. S1 is always subject to Basel Accord, uh, the global standards. The segments S2, S3, and S4 are subject to gradually proportional requirements while maintaining an uh, overall coherence across segments. And the final one, the S5, is consistent with the others, but as, as simple as possible while upholding prudence, prudence, sorry, upholding prudence. The ultimate goal is to have an increasingly solid financial system that supports the real economy at any point of the business cycle, efficiency, financial inclusion, and promoting innovation. So let me now turn to the second part of my talk today, financial innovation. You know, innovative business models and technologies and change risk return landscapes are also calling for more dynamic approaches to banking. Innovation is a powerful drive of competition, efficient margins and profitability and financial inclusion. Innovation has improved the competition and drawn the financial industry barriers to entry. For several years, some costs facing new entrants were high, making the financial industry accessible only to big players. This scenario has been detrimental to competition. As an example, for countries with large territories in thousands of municipalities, such as Brazil, a vast network of physical branches has been a determining factor for success of financial institutions. Innovative ways to reach out to customers have put that advance in check. 
new entrants can develop new business models based on internet banking and mobile applications, reducing the need for investments in physical facilities. Innovation has allowed new firms to operate in the credit market. For instance, by functioning as platforms, connecting lenders and borrowers, or by performing credit risk analysis. Low origination and the lending business more generally are also benefiting from innovation in data processing and technologies such as robo-advisors. These technologies are increasingly allowing companies of different size to coexist. The adoption, adoption of new technology, technologies has had a positive impact on the efficiency of financial industry. New comp competitors are inspiring traditional institutions to rethink their processes, seeking ways to do more and better with fewer resources. Technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning have streamlined banks' back-office operation, from faster customers' response to cheaper record-keeping for compliance proposals. In addition, the use of new data sources, for example, from social media, has allowed financial institutions to provide products and services in a more efficient way. An interesting outcome of this whole process was the restoration of consumer centrality in the financial sector. Previous institutions would develop their standard portfolio of products and services and customers would have to adjust to them. Nowadays, inspired by other industries, financial institutions are struggling to cater to customers' needs. The design of financial products and services focuses also on improving user experience and transparency. As far as margins are concerned, the use of state-of-the-art data processing has facilitated credit screening. Big data, data mining, and processing tools, among others, are enable companies to calculate credit scores lowering the interest rate individuals and companies pay at the end of the day. This is particularly relevant in countries facing problems of adverse selection in remote and unserved regions. An additional facet to the topic is that innovation lead competition has challenged high margin in specific segments, products and services. New business models and better data are improving access to financial services. Widespread availability of bro broadband internet, bread cre better credit information, and mobile application applications have given individuals as in small and medium-sized enterprise, even from underprivileged regions, access to credit. Financial institution is definitely a major challenge in Latin America, and I am convinced, convinced fintechs can really help us address it. So far, I have called your attention to some opportunities that can come up with fintech, but it is imperative to talk about the risk derived from these new developments too. Regulators and supervisors have some concern as threat risk, increasing reliance on third parties for critical services of the financial institution business and consumer protection, especially regarding customers' data. And how regulators around the globe, in particular the Central Bank of Brazil, are addressing innovation in the financial sector? We are adapting the legal and regulatory framework to support financial innovation. Our challenge is to accomplish this adaptation while ensuring that risks are properly understood and subject to appropriate prudential requirements. Less overhead costs, more adequate regulation, 
and innovation should enable institutions to become more effective. New business models to arise, competition to thrive, increasing efficiency of the financial sector while safeguarding the robustness of the financial system. To finalize my remarks, I want to emphasize the importance of the financial education, considering that an ever increasing part of the population has access to financial products and services, this challenge, this challenge becomes even more important, particularly to, for countries whose population education levels are low, such as Brazil. People with little or no access at all to financial products and services are now paying with credit card and borrowing money from banks and fintechs companies. We need to improve the financial education too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Damaso. We now have the presentation by Dr. Dobrit. Please, Andreas. My dear colleague, uh, Otavio, Minister, Professor, thank you very much for the invitation uh, and thank you to all of you for, for taking time. Time is the most valuable thing one has and uh, um, apart from maybe health, but time is kind of important. So um, I, appreciate for your, I appreciate your time and your interest. Let's be honest, this is a topic for gourmets, you know, who really are getting to the bottom of things, so not everybody uh, uh, is interested, but that you are interested is a big honor to me. And it's, uh, it's always good to be back in uh, Rio de Janeiro, um, um, despite the fact that I live uh, a 12-hour flight away, uh, I keep in touch with current developments in Brazil as much as I can. There are some good newspapers um, everywhere which uh, inform me, and so I am quite aware of uh, your hot economic and financial topics here in Brazil, at least I hope to be aware. Um, such as current international developments and monetary policies with interest rates here, uh, but also where I come from at record low levels, uh, not to mention one or two interesting political developments, one of which took place yesterday and uh, upcoming elections, so lots of things uh, to follow from abroad. Uh, I must disappoint you, I'm not going to talk about those because it's not really my uh, field of expertise. Uh, um, uh, um, but um, like uh, you in Brazil, also in Europe, uh, there's an ongoing and broad upswing um, in the advanced economies of Europe, economic upswing of quite some, um, quite some effort. Uh, but in contrast to the United States, um, and the interest rate policies and monetary policies of the United States, uh, the euro area is still in another phase. We are not there yet where the United States is in terms of normalizing our interest rates. Instead, I thought rather than talking about politics in Brazil or Germany for that matter, I would like to share with you my views on the challenges of regulating the financial markets in Europe and in Brazil. I know much more about this in Europe, but as Otavio mentioned, we also work cl closely together in in international fora, so I have a little bit of a feeling of where you, where you guys are in Brazil. Clearly, I'm much more of an expert of uh, the European f uh, financial sector, and for that reason, I have decided to focus on those uh, regulatory topics in Europe where I think they relate to your situation in Brazil and um, where there is some relevance uh, and some special interest for you here namely on the finalization of the global uh, post-crisis regulation, which is of course not a European but a global um, effort. And I would like to talk about regulatory challenges to be met in a digital financial world, just as Otavio did. Now regarding banking regulation after the global financial crisis, uh, I must say that we actually reached quite a milestone uh, not too long ago. Uh, basically, in December of last year, um, the Basel Committee finalized uh, Basel III. It took us a long time to get there. It took us um, uh, more than six years to do the end leg of Basel III. Um, uh, and just as a reminder, 
then I'll come back to that. Basel III is a minimum standard uh, that imposes uh, limits on the risks that internationally active banks uh, actually can take. Now, the Basel Committee, as I said, has worked since the onset of the financial crisis to find a global solution, very important, a global solution to the problems that led to the crisis. So it's a response, it's a crisis response effort. Uh, however, uh, good rules are of little value if, uh, if they are not implemented properly. You can have the best rules in the world without good implement implementation, they are not worth anything. And therefore, what counts in the end is taking the next step and mastering the implementation of Basel III, something the central banks of this world cannot do, but the finance ministers of this world uh, uh, have to do. Um, and I think we should not blind ourselves to the fact that we will continue to experience headwinds with, uh, with regard the implementation of Basel III. And headwinds will come from several directions. It will come from those who go against internationally agreed policies and rules. There are some people who don't want internationally agreed rules, simply. Uh, it will come from those who think banking and the economy would profit from a looser grip. We should have less regulation. Uh, and uh, it will come from those in the financial sector who claim that they have been treated unfairly by Basel III and that Basel III is just putting too much pressure on them and that they will have a very hard time coping with Basel, with Basel III. So we're going to have headwinds in implementing uh, the fact that uh, the governors and heads of supervision agreed on Basel III in December of last year is by all means not the end of, of, this, uh, of this saga. So in Europe and in Germany, uh, some banks, quite a number of banks, have been expressing opinions along the lines of this third argument uh, that they will have a hard time coping with implementing Basel III. Now, while I can see that regulatory, ref regulatory reforms are burdensome for the European banking sector, no doubt about that, that's going to pose quite some burdens on the European banks, especially in an already burdensome environment of banking, which we have now, I'm thinking of the low interest rate environment, which doesn't make banking very easy. I'm thinking of the dig digital challenges Otavio has spoken about and others. Uh, I'm thinking about the banking union we are trying to enforce in Europe. So these different challenges, though they happen to come together and that though they happen to coincide, should not be lumped together. It's not fair just because they come at the same time to, to, to argue that they are lumped together. They are not. Uh, uh, and they do not count as arguments against robust global minimum standards. The standards of the final Basel III package are overall, I would argue, manageable for the banks. They're not great. They're going to be some burden, but they are manageable for institutions also in Germany and also in Europe. And even more so, given the very, very generous implementation period which we have agreed upon. Uh, for example, uh, what is known as the output floor, um, a very distinctive and a very important feature uh, of the final package of Basel III, will not come fully into place until 2027. And let's be honest about this, 2027 is 20 years after the outbreak of the financial crisis. And uh, there must be a limit. There's almost a generation uh, of, uh, you know, of people uh, since the outbreak of the financial crisis. And we have to come to an end at some point. And I think if you are not able as a bank to change your business model from now, 2017, when we finalize this, until 2027, you're never going to make a difference. So I think we need it long. Uh, implementation phases, but there must be also a limit to how long you can actually you can actually have such an implementation period. Uh, moreover, let me stress how valuable a global compromise on banking standards is, especially given um, our experiences with the new uh, administration in the United States of America. Now, back in 1974, it was actually a German bank. Uh, which most of you uh, may not remember, but some of you may remember, the name was Herstadt Bank, a very small German private bank which had been engaged in speculating in foreign exchange 
far above its risk uh, capacity and far above and at the expense of its international counterparties. And it was this small German bank which actually invoked the Basel Committee uh, and finally led to Basel I and then eventually uh, led to Basel II. Basel I was enacted in 1988. So it took quite a long time to agree to go from 1974 and the breakdown of this German bank until Basel I and then until 2004 for Basel II and 2018 for Basel III. I think we need to keep in mind that each of these sets of rules was originally designed to level the playing field for internationally active banks across the globe. It was never really meant to have a small Brazilian bank be covered by these rules. It was the idea for those where, which are internationally active and internationally uh, connected, how do we, what kind of same rules do we have for those internationally active banks? And in order to prevent a race to the bottom amongst jurisdictions, this is a very, very important part. We wanted with Basel to make sure that, that jurisdictions don't arbitrage themselves out against each other, but that we go together at least for the international active banks. But I must say that the global financial crisis proved beyond question that the international framework still has some major weaknesses. If we learn something, then we saw the weaknesses in the financial crisis. And banks in Europe, and by the way, to my knowledge, also banks across the globe, have never opposed this reasoning in general, that there are still weaknesses in our framework. Um, but they must also accept that it's not a shared theory that will make global banking more reliable in the future, but a workable global compromise. Theory alone, and if I have to say that at a university, is important, but at the end, you need to find a compromise in order to make sure that things actually go together. And this is why I am a very strong supporter of a swiftly and completely implementation of the standards of the Europe, uh, in the European Union. Uh, and we, would, we have to make the standards of Basel III in Europe a binding reality. And I very much, by the way, expect all the members of the Basel Committee to do all the members of the Basel Committee to do likewise, including Brazil, more importantly, including uh, the United States of America. Um, uh, we want everybody to be part of this as they signed this of this agreement, and we I think we all need to focus all of our energy on the consistent implementation of the Basel rules and that they are rigorous, rigorous, rigorously applied. Otherwise, they are simply written paper and they don't mean too much. Please do me the favor of noting two very important quali qualifications, however. But the first qualification is, as I said before, that the Basel standards are minimum standards. This means that countries can actually opt to set stricter requirements if they would like to do so. Uh, Switzerland, as one example, as a good example, has a higher leverage ratio than everybody else. The Swiss are arguing that the size of the financial sector is so large compared to their real economy that they want to have more security and they want to have a, a, a higher leverage ratio. And as many of you actually probably know, the United Kingdom has a ring fencing rules in place and they are ring fencing the vital basic parts of of the banking system mostly the retail banking from the more riskier parts of the of the banking system they are this is called the vickers rule now even though this policy even though the vickers rule is not part of the making of the basel committee of course the united kingdom can have stricter rules than uh, the basel committee and they can of course implement some of these things in the United Kingdom. So Basel III is a minimum standard, which means that you can, of course, deviate uh, from that. Um, the second qualification I would like to make is that Basel standards are intended for, and they are actually also tailored to large, complex, and internationally active financial institutions. As a result, the rules themselves have become large and extremely complex, I must say. Uh, we are now talking thousands of pages of, of Basel III, and Basel III is clearly not an exception of being a very, a very complex set of rules. Appropriate as they are for global players, those rules, 
The rules tend to overburden small institutions, very much as, Ot as Otavio said. I share this view very much. To demonstrate, let me, let me refer to the German banking system uh, because it is, I think, a case in point. As you may know, in Germany, they, we still have roughly 1,700 different banks, so a very, very fragmented banking system, several, which, several of which are big players and many of which are small players and small institutions. Some of these smaller institutions still have a balance sheet worth no more than a few hundred million euros, very small. Some of them have very few uh, people uh, who actually work at these institutions. Some of those are called savings banks, some of, some of those are called cooperative banks, and they work with very small staff and very small balance sheets. These small institutions are, of course, having a hard time with rules that are aimed at large and complex banks, uh, you know, because they were never really made for those small institutions. The main problems is the compliance workload, um, uh, that is the work involved in meeting the requirements and actually demonstrating that, that you have also met those requirements. And this is to say that the rules could act as an additional handicap for small banks. Um, um, those banks which are already under pressure for many sides. Or take the rapid digitalization I'll speak about in a, in a little bit, uh, for example, or take the low interest rate environment in Europe. We do have low and sometimes negative interest rates. So these small banks are anyhow having a hard time and now they have to comply with a workload which is meant for globally active international banks but not for them. And one reaction we are seeing in Germany is that the small banks are merging because they cannot cope with those compliance uh, uh, costs anymore. They think they need to get and they believe they need to get bigger in order to uh, stretch those costs over a bigger operation. And this consolidation is, uh, is going on and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, continuing. But as supervisors and regulators, it cannot be, and I mean this very seriously, it cannot be in our interest to overburden smaller institutions with rules that were actually uh, designed for their larger peers. That's not our job. We are not doing our job if we actually overburden small institutions with uh, a regulation which have nothing to do with their business models. And this would effectively give an advantage to larger banks. It will create an advantage for a business model of a larger bank. And we, as supervisors, should not have a view and we should not cast a view which business model is better and which size is better. The market should do that. So actually, by forcing smaller banks into the consolidation, we are actually making a mistake. Uh, and especially if we force rules on them, which were meant for, largely, uh, for large institutions. So this argument I'm making even becomes stronger as some requirements developed for large international banks have proved rather inefficient and ineffective for small credit institutions. Simply because these enterprises are less complex, uh, are not active in comparable business areas, and are therefore exposed also to fewer risks, to far fewer risks, I should say. During the crisis year, small institutions proved to be more robust. When the financial crisis were hitting, was hitting Germany, it was the larger banks which had the problem, not the smaller banks. They were rather robust, not least because of their simple and less risky business model. Um, this is why, actually, jurisdictions are free to apply a different set of rules to smaller banks, which operate solely within their national markets and which actually pose no threat to international financial stability. So as you say, we have to be proportionate to the vis-a-vis uh, -vis banks which do pose a threat to financial stability and do have riskier models and some which don't. Otherwise, we're not doing a good job. So most countries, as we now learned, including Brazil, already have less restrictive rules in place for smaller banks in order to ease the operational burden on those smaller banks. And I am a strong proponent of extending this proportionality even further in Europe, we are actually are currently busy in fine-tuning our regulatory framework by providing some additional relief for small, low-risk uh, institutions, and we're working very hard in order to get there as soon as we can. At the same time, this means, importantly, that we're not going to change liquidity and capital requirements. We're talking about easing operational burdens, not 
uh, having a, level, a different level playing field on the capital and liquidity front. Uh, but what we are doing is we are aiming to reduce disclosure requirements. How often do you have to disclose what amount of data? We try to simplify reporting uh, and we try to exempt some institutions from a recovery and resolution planning amongst other things. To give you one example, uh, as a large bank, you have to fill out renumeration spreadsheets, how many people earn above 1 million euros a year, etc., etc. None of these small banks come close to this amount. So I have 1,500 banks sending me a form with only blanks, and I need to have people who actually check that the blanks are all blank. You know, that doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, you know, we can simplify the reporting quite a bit and make it more appropriate and proportional to the real needs. So what's the global state of play in matters of bank regulation, uh, you may ask? One major step forward, the finalization of Basel III has already been taken. And now the next equally important step is implementing those rules, as I said before. During implementation, we should bear in mind that Basel standards, as I said, are minimum, not maximum standards. Nevertheless, they are designed for the global players and we need to make sure that we regulate proportionate between global players and regional, smaller, less risky players. Importantly, this principle of proportionality, Otavio talked about it also, must not be mistaken as a loophole to allow lax implementation or even deregulation. That's not what we have in mind. That's, of course, not mentioned. So, ladies and gentlemen, as regards the road towards a more resilient global financial system after the financial crisis, we are in the driver's seat, Otavio and myself, actually. And what's more, we also, I would argue, we know also know the direction we want to drive to. So we, have, we pretty clearly know what we want to do, and Basel III is helping us uh, describe the way. But where digitalization is concerned, this is a lot less the case. I would even say it's not the case. We still cannot know for sure where the digitalization of the financial sector will actually lead us, um, even though we are currently right in the middle of it. Um, and for those of us in the driving seat of banking regulation and, and of banking supervision, this makes us feel a little bit uneasy to be in the middle of a process, not knowing where the process is actually going. Uh, we, no, nobody likes this uh, particularly. I would like to talk a little bit about that uh, because it's such an important phenomenon. It is not that we are unable to cope with changes and uncertainty per se. Um, in fact, our change and sectoral adjustments have been constants and have been there all the time in the banking sector in Europe and also in the banking sector in Germany. Banking sectors are changing, so that's not really new. Market environment, customer habits and technologies in banks have been constantly evolving over the last decades. Uh, and they have done and they still do the, also in Brazil. That's not the new part of this. So if, if we understand digitalization as um, evolving, an evolving of a new uh, technology, that's not new really. In Germany today, in the middle of a low interest rate environment, many, many banks are adjusting their business models. Since the early 1990s, so not that long ago, the total number of banks and the total number of savings banks in Germany has more than halved. Consolidation is um, really going fast. For regulators and for supervisors, those changes in the business environment mostly have not challenged the way we work. Our work has not changed very much despite the fact that the marketplace has changed quite dramatically. Now, with regard to the digitalization of the banking sector, I would argue that we should likewise not get nervous, not get over nervous about innovation and about new competitors, as they are, I think we are on the same side here, uh, Otavio, as these new uh, competitors are welcome as part of a healthy environment. Now, I heard you say something similar. Of greater concern for us as supervisors and regulators is that the digitization of the banking sector may possibly change the gameplay altogether. Uh, consider, for example,
the speed of transformation. Um, in a digital world, it is very likely to increase. Speed will not decrease, speed will increase. Uh, that's probably um, um, at, at least my expectation. For instance, customer fluctuation, something which we didn't have in Germany very much. Banks consolidated, but the customer stayed with their banks. So customer fluctuation is expected to rise as competitors are available uh, at their fingertips, so to say, uh, at their smartphone. Worldwide rivalry is likely to increase through online competition, something we haven't seen in the past. Time to market is becoming crucial for some businesses. How much time do I need to come to market with a new product? Which again is likely to influence the product development altogether. Uh, in the past decades, time to market was not none of our concern really. Now it has become a major concern for banks and also for supervisors. And all these dynamics may well feed into the risk landscapes because if you are, if you have to be very quick with your products, you can also make mistakes and then uh, the risk uh, probably does not decrease but uh, probably is likely to rise. So there are numerous consequences that are worth pondering uh, from a stability perspective and regulators and supervisors always come from the stability perspective. Think, uh, for instance, of the threat of a rapid disruption of business models or think of systemic operational risks. Cyber risk would be a logical one in this respect. Now I'm, I'm well aware that the whole digitalization trend has produced a host of buzzwords and uh, a host of metaphysical theories, some of which might never materialize. No major disruption has occurred to date, although we're in the middle of the process. Uh, if you look to the German banking sector, for example, there are segments like um, internet payments uh, where new market entrants have taken the banks, the incumbent banks by surprise, I must say, but these developments have not, have had limited effects outside of those segments. So uh, a full disruption of the business model of a, of a bank has not happened so far. It has happened in some segments, but not in the principle of banking as we know it. Also, while new market entrants initially took an aggressive approach, a rather aggressive approach towards incumbents, different forms of cooperation are uh, 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 usual today. Uh, we observe a, a blend of competition and cooperation uh, as well as a widening of service. Many, many, many fintechs are interested in selling themselves to banks and work together with banks and not necessarily only competing with banks. And an abundance of new business ideas have turned up from white label banking uh, to digital ecosystem strategies, so things have changed, but it's not a total disruption of a banking business model. So as a preliminary su summary of digitalization, I would say that as of today, digital revolution fantasies haven't really come true. So uh, five years ago, it was very fashionable to, s to speak about these revolution fantasies and uh, the, the end of banking. I'm not so sure uh, we are seeing the end of banking. I wasn't so sure five years ago, but now, five years later, uh, I would still think uh, we look at regulation, if we look at, ne uh, at regulation, earlier narratives about the end of banks have ceased and have gone away, and now it's a much more productive um, discussion. But not long ago, the so-called fintechs were presented as opponents, as enemies, so to say, of classic banks. Today, some fintechs have even acquired a banking license. They actually apply, apply, uh, asked me for banking licenses. Uh, so that means, what does that mean? It means that, that these fintechs have to fulfill exactly the same requirements as other age-old institutions. So they are now at the same level playing field as the banks, um, which, you know, in the past, five years ago, that was a contradiction that as a fintech you could never ask for a banking license because all you wanted was to, to be replacing the banks. Now you are asking for the same license, which of course is uh, uh, also a new phenomenon which was not predicted five years ago. So the question is, have we seen all 
that digitization has to offer? Not at all, uh, if you ask me. We have not seen the end of, the, of, of digitization. At the present point in time, the transformation is only gaining momentum. We are not at the end of digitization. From other sectors of the economy, we have learned uh, time and again how digitization has, tr has actually transformed business. And the most uh, prominent example is, of course, the music industry, where selling individual pieces of music on demand online seemed like the end of the narrative of cutthroat competition Music streaming services now suddenly appeared and quickly gained market share. So again, you have seen uh, um, an evolution also in the music industry. Um, in banking, uh, business changes and changes in customer habits are likely to reinforce each other over time, would be my prediction. We simply cannot predict, I, I simply cannot predict what this will lead us to. I think that's too early, early to say. But regarding regulation, I guess it's fair to say that we have already learned a valuable lesson. If we want to find good regulation for a digital financial world, we cannot build it on uh, superficial distinctions. We have to look closely at each and every case. It is a case-by-case -case decision. It's not a very general uh, approach which uh, we are allowed. Be it in crypto tokens, robo-advice, or payment services, uh, whether it constitutes a risky financial business or whether it constitutes merely an additional service, will depend on details and is not something you can that easily decide on a general level. When advancing regulation, we should not be blinded by the catchy terminology and by the innovative technologies which are applied, but instead we should look at the concrete business models as bank supervisors has always done in the past. So regulating financial business in the digital area has become a topic that engages entire continents like Latin America or let, like the Americas and, and Europe, and I think rightly so. Because simply speaking, if you create a superior algorithm once, you can actually distribute it across the globe and scale it uh, uh, to vir at virtually no cost. So if you do that, you're not confined to a continent and you can go global in no time. And like good business ideas, there are various threats out there that may transgress borders all too easily. And this is, let me come to a close, where I'm convinced that we will benefit greatly from um, seminars like this today because seminars like these are cross-border exchanges and, cr and, to, and to exchange views and exchange ideas cross-border and even cross-continent makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, today we are already exchanging experiences at the Basel Committee, at the Financial Stability Board, at many of these international fora uh, and uh, I'm certain that such an interaction and also such visits of mine uh, to, to Brazil and uh, visits of Ottavio to Europe uh, will intensify in the months and years ahead and that they're very, very, very important uh, and uh, that we need to exchange and learn from each other and exchange our views. It's true that some countries are more reluctant than others to embrace digital finance. Not every country is uh, as forthcoming as than other. And interpretations of an acceptable scope in promoting innovation differ across jurisdictions. What some people think is acceptable, others don't. But as with the Basel minimum standards for banks, we need to take a long-term perspective when assessing the reasons for rules of the digital financial services. I would urge for long-term rather than short-term views because with digital innovations, as with the traditional risks in banking, pretty much the same as with the traditional risks in banking, we all have to unite in ensuring that digital innovation now, as we have it now, will not be the origin of the next crisis, which of course could be the case. And this, I think, should motivate us even more 
to do long trips flying from continent to continent in order to exchange views. And that's why I thank you very much again uh, for having organized this seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dombret. We're now going to hear the comments by Minister Marcillo. As unfortunately I will have to leave in about half an hour, I will discuss both papers uh, as you did uh, in that order. <coughs> First, uh, by the way, I, I would say both uh, presentations were very interesting, precise, and uh, uh, I think are an important contribution for the study of uh, this very important topic, which is uh, prudence regulations, uh, which uh, aim at the same time at efficiency and uh, uh, to uh, prudence to uh, uh, safeguard both the customers and the banks. Uh, speaking about uh, uh, Damaso's uh, paper and presentation, I think it was very important what he mentioned about regulatory proportionality and uh, uh, Andreas Dombert, uh, by the way, uh, very much uh, was in favor of uh, this uh, uh, idea of not trying to impose on very small banks uh, regulations that are very much uh, important for large banks uh, and uh, he mentioned also that uh, the authorities should not uh, try to force consolidations because this uh, would have a r negative uh, effect in terms for instance of cons competition I think uh, if you would have a, a word with just uh, half a dozen banks is not really something that we should aim at. Uh, 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 what maybe uh, Mr. Damaso could uh, uh, try to give some uh, additional information is the fact that uh, uh, Andreas uh, did uh, go a step ahead in terms of uh, uh, trying to understand the bank of the future or, or banking in the future uh, which includes new uh, uh, actors like fintechs uh, which may uh, include even new currencies like cryptocurrencies uh, and uh, a series of uh, new uh, uh, innovations like blockchain for instance, uh, uh, robo advice and uh, uh, payment services done in a different method. Uh, so my question to Damaso would be uh, how he uh, uh, envisions this uh, type of uh, developments and one specific uh, question about the Brazilian uh, regulatory environment uh, speaking uh, to one topic which he mentioned which is consumer protection uh, uh, I know that Central Bank is trying to uh, decrease a little bit what is charged uh, by banks which in Brazil uh, 
Dr. Andreas, uh, there are some banks and that uh, uh, ask for 400 percent per year, uh, which nobody knows. I, I, since my time as minister, we tried to uh, understand this a little bit. Uh, Herminio Fraga, who worked for me, uh, was one of them. Who, and he's still studying, by the way. First, the reason why this exists and, and the, uh, how uh, uh, the central bank can do, uh, not by putting uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, some limits to it in a kind of uh, uh, raw way. Uh, I have been studying this uh, controversy about usury laws since the Middle Ages, and then, uh, and uh, I know it's a very, very difficult question. In Brazil, this has been uh, a very uh, strong uh, topic also. Uh, bankers, only in the 11th century, uh, they were not allowed yet to go to heaven, but they could go to a middle of uh, way. Uh, but uh, the question would be about uh, how to really try to uh, uh, solve this because it has become a trap because somebody who owes uh, a debt and has to be 400 percent a, a year really is not uh, uh, solvable. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's self destructive. Uh, so, this would be the, the, the two main questions to you. One about how to you see this new development. Uh, uh, I have a friend, Andreas, who works in with uh, cryptocurrencies, and he has one million clients, more than the Bovespa has, <laughs> which for me was a big, big uh, uh, surprise. Uh, so it is, uh, I think, a, a large ch challenge. Uh, uh, the work by Andreas was equally very interesting, and. Uh, and the, one of the features which I uh, found uh, even theoretically very important was this long period uh, to implement. Uh, uh, yesterday I was uh, uh, speaking to another group uh, about uh, the reforms in Brazil, both tax reforms and uh, 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 retirement funds for reforms. And what I did uh, suggest always is these big reforms, and in banking reforms it's the same, is not uh, a final goal. It's really a beginning of a road uh, uh, in which you gradually uh, arrive uh, at what you really mean. Uh, uh, I also uh, mentioned, uh, I mean, was struck by uh, uh, a comment, I think, by you about theory and practice. And this reminded me of Emmanuel Kant who said, a theory which cannot be translated in practice is a wrong theory. <laughs> uh, uh, as I said, uh, your views about proportionality were the, uh, exactly the same, which is something very... And uh, your idea, I think, about uh, this type of seminars and other 
uh, of similar uh, objectives are very important because uh, the future ahead, uh, we know, uh, is a transformation in theory now. Uh, what we know is what we really will be the outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Marcilio. <coughs> we now shall open for, uh, for questions. Any of you who prefer <coughs> to ask a question in Portuguese, please feel free to do so. But perhaps, if I may, I would like to raise the first question uh, to both of you, to the two central bankers who are, who are here. Uh, it has already been mentioned uh, this morning uh, how fast financial innovation is, is occurring. And uh, one of the novelties of uh, recent years has been, as everybody knows, the so-called cryptocurrencies. Uh, I believe uh, cryptocurrency is a misnomer uh, to the extent that uh, those assets do not qualify exactly uh, as money since they do not perform the classical roles of, uh, the classical roles, uh, of money. But anyway, it's a reality, and for me, it's quite easy to understand the reason uh, why central banks should be... Uh, Minister Marcelo said he has to leave, so... Um, interrupt for a second. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, so I was saying, I mean, uh, it's quite easy to understand the reason why central banks should, uh, should follow, I mean, uh, developers in this area. Uh, to say the least, perhaps uh, we could mention the fact that central banks might have to intervene at some point uh, down the road or, or at an earlier point anyway. So it's quite important to know what's going on. But many people, uh, take a, a, a step further and uh, propose that central banks should adopt uh, some sort of a cryptocurrency of their own to be sort of a Bitcoin issued by, uh, by the central bank. It's not so clear for me, I mean, what the benefits of uh, such an introduction would be. Uh, perhaps uh, to increase, uh, supposedly to increase the safety of, uh, of the system, I don't know. But I mean, it's an idea which is around. Others are less radical and imagine that central banks could uh, eventually adopt uh, digital currencies that would be a replacement of cash. And in such a world, economic agents in general would have a, a current, a sort of a current account at a given central bank. And transfers would be in payments, would be made uh, a lot easier and supposedly at a much less, in a much less expensive way. Of course, this sounds like a, a revolution. Uh, I doubt that this is going to be implemented uh, in the short or medium uh, term. But I think it would be interesting to learn, I mean, the ideas, I mean, how, how the Brazilian Central Bank and the Buddhist Bank have uh, approached uh, this issue. In what stage uh, are you in? And uh, what the prospects, sorry? Oh, it, it, it's completely up to you. And then, then I start, then I, then I start. Thank you. Now, first of all, um, as you said yourself, um, these are not currencies. They are called cryptocurrencies. Um, a currency has uh, several uh, criteria it needs to fulfill, uh, which um, cryptocurrencies don't fulfill. They don't keep the value. They are pretty bad in transferring payments from A to B. If you pay your coffee at Starbucks um, with, uh, let's say, bitcoins, it takes you 14 minutes. The coffee is cold. Uh, uh, when you, when you, when you, when you, uh, you know, if th should they only give you the coffee once you have uh, paid, it could be too late to enjoy the coffee. So, so, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, uh, and but then you you mentioned these are crypto assets. I'm not sure they're even assets. You know they are they are uh, you know I would wonder 
uh, whether there are assets there, some tokens, or you know, if you if you get, you know, maybe you just we should just speak about cryptos and uh, uh, not make sure make sure that this is not. Uh, uh, and then you ask the question: um, Do central banks have to intervene? Um, clearly, we need rules on consumer protection, as you said, and clearly we need rules on any anti-money laundering, no doubt. But, you know, um, if you would like to invest into a Bitcoin, why should I have a problem with that? Other people are buying Picassos or uh, pork bellies or other uh, investments, and uh, uh, as long as these people know that they can lose their entire investment at any time, uh, why does the state, why does the government have to say, you're not allowed to speculate in this? Um, I wonder, I would be a little bit more liberal about that, and I wonder whether we have to regulate everything. Um, you should uh, say, the second question we have, have was, had was, should central banks adopt crypto, whatever, cryptos, <coughs> and why? And you mentioned cash. Clearly in some countries uh, c the usage of cash is going down, but the fact that less cash is used and more digital is used doesn't, need, doesn't say that this digital may not be in real or euros or dollars, but it needs to be in cryptos. The logic is not there. You, of course you can uh, have digital payments and you should, but that is the link between cryptos and digital payments in other real currencies, you know, there is no link, and that's uh, that's why I wonder. Uh, our thinking, <coughs> excuse me, our thinking is to make a long story short: is don't shoot from the hip. Uh, you know, the banks who always um, are afraid of regulation are now asking why, how you want to regulate that, and I think we should wait and see and observe this. This is not a something which is a danger to international financial stability. We are talking at best 1% of international funds being in these cryptos. So we are not in danger. Every quick action, there's no need for a quick action. And if we, and, uh, if we shoot from the hip, we're going to make a mistake. Uh, as this is, as you said yourself, a fundamental issue for central banking. So I don't know why we have to regulate everything uh, why we cannot observe this and why not why we why we why we cannot research this at universities why we cannot wait and see how much this in development will take place rather than overreact uh, and, and and feel the need of of very harsh regulation clearly on the anti-money uh, anti laundering aspects and clearly on the aspects of consumer protection we need to do something but otherwise I, our stance, our recommended stance would be not to shoot from the hip, but to watch this, analyze this, and come in a, into an international agreement, because if Brazil and Germany, for example, or Brazil and Europe would come to separate results, what would that really help us, you know? So we would have to have an international global response to this, and global responses don't happen overnight. Andreas, uh, what about digital currencies? Simple digital currencies? I mean, the uh, you know, people having a current account at central banks, I mean, the might we go in that direction? Um, this, is, this is not something um, which I envisage as being urgent because at the end of the day, if you would have these cryptos in central banks, you would circumvent the banking system and there would be a direct contact between the consumer and the central bank. So why do we want? to endanger the banking system, which is working reasonably well, uh, having a new system with a direct account of each and every citizen with the central bank, uh, what would be the benefit of that, I would ask you. You know, many, many, many people are arguing in favor of cryptos because they don't trust the banking system. I don't have the problem with mistrust in the banking system. I have quite some trust in the banking system. So I don't see why we have to get rid of an entire banking system, uh, which is working, uh, how we create money, yeah, um, uh, uh, which is well researched by something which is not researched. Um, and uh, if I may say so, 
these cryptos, um, uh, whatever, crypto tokens, let me call it crypto tokens, uh, the correlation of the usage of crypto tokens in countries with high capital controls is very high. The higher the capital control, the higher the use of cryptos. I understand why. Uh, why is uh, the use of, you know, clearly 100% of cryptos are used in the darknet. You can understand why, because you cannot see uh, who is paying and uh, you cannot follow, uh, you know, why uh, then tax evasion is basically also done via cryptos. Why should I, as a, rep as a representative of the state, favor something like that? You know, a, a darknet, uh, a capital control evasion or tax evasion system. This is none of my business to the contrary. So uh, uh, I, I, I don't see the reason why to use them if we don't know all the circ all the consequences and all the uh, all the effects this has uh, there is no need to rush would be my point so uh, thank you uh, i fully agree with mr andreas uh, we are not talking about uh, cryptocurrency we are talking about uh, something like uh, crypto tokens crypto assets assets uh, it is not uh, responsible for central banks, it's more responsible for security exchange commission. And uh, this is the main message that uh, the G20 discussed in the last meeting in Argentina, the beginning, last month, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, last month, né? in March. So uh, in the case of Central Bank of Brazil, uh, we are not planning to do anything uh, regarding regulation of crypto assets, crypto tokens. At this moment, we know that the security exchange, Brazilian security exchange, did some regulation regarding it, but it is uh, 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 it's responsible uh, regulated the ICOs, uh, digital assets, digital tokens. What uh, the Central Bank of Brazil did, and I think it is the same that other central bank did, is warning, release a warning uh, about what the consumer uh, are buying and using with this cryptocurrency. No? Uh, we need to separate uh, crypto assets, tokens, even as uh, the population called cryptocurrency from the technology of blockchain. The technology of blockchain probably will be one of the most important technology to be introduced in the financial sector. And many banks and many financial institutions, they are developing projects uh, using blockchain and other DLT technologies. No? Uh, we need to, to distinguish even uh, those called uh, cryptocurrency from the electronic uh, currency that it is uh, associated with the payment institution. This uh, digital uh, electronic uh, digital currency we did regulate in case of Brazil in 2013 and it is using in the payment system. Uh, and uh, the final point is regarding the real, euro, cryptocurrency. I think uh, we need to discuss too much this uh, uh, way. Uh, as Andreas said, uh, if, if uh, any central bank decide to, to uh, go in this way, many things will change in the financial sector, in the banking sector. Yeah. And uh, I, I believe that many uh, central banks are studying, but I don't know if uh, there is any specific case uh, that the one central bank decide to implement uh, one kind of the uh, sovereign cryptocurrency. Uh, it is a uh, if one decides to do this, many things can change in the bank sector. So, let me, oh no, thank let you me, so much. Let uh, me, let me add one, one two track. thoughts which I forgot. And <laughs> I, by the way, I also forgot uh, to say technology is different from uh, uh, from uh, cryptos, which is a very good point. Uh, just uh, as a practical example, 
No German bank up to now has asked us for approval uh, to hold any instruments in crypto, whatever, tokens. Um, so uh, they are very worried about the know your customer um, aspects, which would be difficult if they are anonymous, then you don't know your customer. So, so, um, uh, so n there have been no application from our 1,700 banks up to now for any of this. But, and that's my second and last thought, should a bank apply to hold, let's say, one instrument or several instruments in crypto tokens, that would not be very difficult from a supervisory point of view because we would regulate and supervise it as any other risky asset. And uh, uh, the volatility is very high so we would ask for a lot of equity to put against it according to the volatility in these uh, tokens. So uh, it would be kind of expensive. Yeah? But we would not need a new set of rules. We could use the set of rules we have right now and take the risk aspect of this instrument and ask for, as, uh, for uh, uh, equivalent adequate capital buffers uh, but as these instruments are very volatile, those buffers will probably have to be very large. Just one more comment uh, regarding financial. Okay, one more uh, comment. Uh, one more comment uh, regarding the Brazilian financial sector. Uh, we don't know any any financial institution institution that it is working with some kind of crypto currency asset uh, tokens uh, in this moment. Uh, we always read in the newspaper about uh, the uh, Bitcoin brokers, but Bitcoin, Bitcoin brokers, uh, uh, they are not financial institutions. They are not regulated by central bank. They are not authorized by the central bank or uh, monetary, parts, uh, monetary committee. So it is a, a, a non-financial enterprise, and it is outside of the regulatory perimeter. I think I have uh, th th three questions at least. One up there, you number number two, Fernando. Uh, for Hi. Uh, uh, I would like to, to thank the speakers for for their excellent presentations. I'd like to, to ask you for your views uh, about open banking. Uh, I understand that in, in Europe it's already underway, I think since January. Uh, I, I think there's some discussion in Brazil, I don't know the, the views of the, the central bank. So what would be uh, the potential of open banking uh, in sense of fostering competition and the risks about uh, consumer protection? Uh, so what are your views? So uh, Andrea asked me to, to start this time, <laughs> but I think uh, he, he has too much more information than I regarding open bank because in, in Europe, open bank is reality. In the case of Brazil, we are now discussing uh, how we can improve the credit bureau. Uh, as everybody knows here, uh, we have in this moment one uh, bill that are being discussed in the Congress, uh, uh, trying to improve our credit bureau system. Yeah? Uh, and uh, after that, the Central Bank of Brazil uh, wants to start to discuss an open bank framework. Uh, we did uh, last week uh, uh, a specific meeting with uh, Brazilian Bank Association uh, to, to open this discussion about open bank. And uh, at this moment, we are trying to understand what is happening with the open bank in Europe, because uh, since the beginning of this year, open bank became a reality in Europe. Uh, I understand that there is two, two, big, two different models regarding open bank, one that is implementing in Europe and one quite different that, I, that is uh, implementing in the UK. In the UK, they decide to, to create uh, a, 
a central body né, uh, to organize the, the, the data flow and uh, I, I, I don't know if the, in the case of Europe or any other European jurisdiction they create a, a kind of central body uh, to, to, to organize the flow of data. But I, I think uh, Andreas can say uh, more about this topic than I. I don't want to say too much about it because it's in the beginning of, of, of happening and we are still comparing different concepts. So, um, I, 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 you know, you, we may not be so much ahead of you. So, um, <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, I would like to, to wait and, and watch more. Yeah. Have a question Only there? to complete this, this topic, uh, I, I believe uh, it will be a very important topic to be discussing in our uh, case here. Uh, we decide to start to discuss, but we don't know where we will arrive. Uh, it is a long project, uh, probably involve one, uh, more than one year to, to discuss, and uh, we have the opportunity to observe what, what is happening in, in Europe, UK, and even in Australia. Australia, uh, they implemented a more broader uh, open bank uh, framework than in Europe. So uh, we are studying this topic. My name is Heinz. My name is Heinz Sadler, technology consultant. Uh, you have mentioned the two ex the two presentations were excellent, giving uh, insight in the industry. What concerns me is Basel. Basel is a cornerstone for the financial industry, and now we're talking Basel three. But the implementation, as you mentioned, up to 27, isn't that a high risk? considering all these wheeling and dealings and unorthodox uh, financial industries and so on. Can we survive without uh, a problem un un until 2027? I understand it's complicated. Um, it was the compromise to, we basically, you know, to, to step back one step. Uh, there are two, two ways to, to get to this compromise. The first way was to compromise at a much lower level and have an earlier um, implementation, laxer regulation but early implementation, uh, or you go for what you really want and have a longer implementation period. That is basically the trade-off uh, which was being discussed. We thought it would be much better to say where we want to go and leave more time for implementation than only go half the way and have earlier implementation, to make a long story very short. Um, so that was because you are giving out the right incentives, and we also have to see how the market values that. Sometimes the market is expecting you to produce these results much earlier than um, the implementation date. That's not what we want. We want to give the banks time until 2027, but we want to change the banks, and we want the banks to change all the way, not only halfway. So that's why we, we came to that compromise. Uh, as Andrea said, it is a compromise, and I, I understand that all Basel members will uh, uh, complete the, the the Basel tree until the end. Uh, one specific topic that I would like to highlight is uh, uh, 2027 is the end of the process. Many things has been done since the beginning of the crisis and many, many uh, parts of the Basel tree uh, was implemented uh, uh, was implemented. Many others will be implemented next year. In the end will be in uh, 2027. So, it is. this is absolutely correct. Uh, the full implementation will be in 2027, but from 2022 onwards, the output for already has to be much higher than it is now, and then year by year it will increase. So, you have a smooth implementation, but that doesn't mean that nothing is happening from now to until 2027, but there is an 
uh, there is a transition phase in between. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is João Lima. I'm a professor of corporate law here at FGV Law School. I have, first of all, I would like to thank for putting this whole, whole event together. And I'll have two questions, one for both central bankers here and, and another one specific for Mr. Otavio. The first one is that you think that the giant techs such as Google or Facebook may help if at any case that is possible if whether the, the central banks decide to regulate the crypto assets or cryptocurrencies, if those giant tax may assist or could assist the central banks or the security exchange commissions, uh, as the case may be, in the regulation of this digital finance and digital economy. That's the first one. And the second question is, if by saying that here in Brazil we can believe that the fintechs may play a role in increasing the and broadening the the scope and reach of the financial marketing by putting more people inside the the financial the organized financial system we may may be thinking that that just changing the financial exclusion for a digital exclusion because the i i read a i read a magazine article this month saying that still now in Brazil we have 70 million people that don't have access to internet so maybe this digital economy here is, as a developing country is not that is not that feasible yet so I would like to hear if possible a little bit from you Why don't I, start, I start with your first question and the inclusion question is much more for my colleague uh, um, now, um, although I have an opinion, but uh, I, he has a much better opinion. Now, with regard to Facebook and others, you know, you are basically asking a question in an area we call shadow banking, uh, and there, the, the answer is very simple. Um, any, any organization which engages in banking whether it's maturity transformation or credit transformation or any like that, will have to be regulated like a bank. Um, so um, there's no doubt in my mind that we will have to go in order to preserve a level playing field. Um, should that be the case, we will go, you know, and everybody in this room is entitled to, to tip the Banque Centrale du Brazil or the Bundesbank or anybody and saying there is somebody, you know, working as a bank without a license, we would go after that uh, uh, participant uh, today. Uh, uh, so uh, if that's not the case, just because you have many clients doesn't mean that we have, you know, that there is a relevance for us as a, as a bank supervisor. So it's a very simple, simple answer. Um, uh, if you are a shadow bank, and you are engaging in banking, you're going to be regulated and supervised, uh, uh, um, uh, very much so. And uh, um, I don't think we're going to have much gray area there. Okay. Well, uh, I fully agree again with Mr. Andreas. Uh, and uh, Shadow Bank was one of the most important topics identify uh, in the, no, the crisis of 2008 and uh, it is it is a permanent topic in our international agenda uh, in the financial stability board and uh, basic committee so uh, as mr. Andreas said uh, we will not permit any kind of shadow bank if any company decide to do banking uh, the company must uh, observe uh, the law, the regulation, and uh, if necessary, uh, go into central bank to get the authorization to operate as a bank. Uh, of course, uh, in the new world where we are going to a digital area, uh, 
we have been discussed too much with uh, all kind of IT providers, all kind of tech, new tech companies. And uh, in the end of April, probably the, uh, the Central Bank and the National Monetary Council will, will publish the, the final rule for cybersecurity policy. And during this, uh, during the process of this uh, new new rule, we discuss with all companies, financial and non-financial companies, to understand the new risk, the cyber risk. Yeah. It is the the answer for the first question. Regarding the second question, uh, I, I I believe that uh, the new era, uh, the digital one digital uh, environment that we are living, uh, we we'll, uh, have the opportunity to improve the inc financial inclusion in Brazil. In 2009, uh, in, in a process of financial inclusion that we observed in the last decade, we had a discussion with all uh, retail banks how can uh, central bank uh, adapt the the legal and regulation framework to facilitate uh, open branch around the country to promote the financial inclusion. Uh, many banks in that period uh, went to the central bank, uh, proposed many things, and we did a new rule in that period in 2009, 2000. 2008, 2009, and, and nowadays they are going the other side. They are closing branch, branches, and uh, the mobile uh, was introduced, and it is a success in Brazil. And uh, we are observing uh, one of the most important natural barriers for financial inclusion in Brazil: uh, the prisons. Uh, the mobile probably will improve the, the financial inclusion. I don't know the number, is the exact numbers, but uh, uh, the last one that I read, uh, there is more mobile than citizens in Brazil. So uh, this is the new channel for bank inclusion. Okay, Otavio, thank you so much. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm Gabriel from the Brazilian Financial and Capital Markets Association. And if I have too many questions for you guys, I, I'll stick to two, uh, and perhaps the easier ones. Uh, so the first one is to tie in the first part of your presentations, the, the two of your presentations about international cooperation and segmentation. So uh, Basel just recently launched a consultation to fine tune the market reform, market risk reform. And in it, they, they, they're asking about the, the simplified approach uh, for market risk, and, and this is not necessarily for international active banks. Uh, it is like a, a Basel two version of steroids. I'd like to know how you two feel. I, I have the impression that you might agree, uh, but I, I don't know how you guys feel about uh, the international uh, central setting body. You know, talking about non-international active uh, banks. Now, the second question, and this one is more geared towards uh, Dombrit, and is. Uh, this market risk reform, it's, it's uh, ideally going to be reflected in the CRD2 and C, I'm sorry, CRD5 and CRR2, right, package? Yes. CRR Perfect, exactly. And, uh, and these are going to be big sweeping reforms, so this is perhaps easier. So uh, what are other reforms that you see on the pipeline out there that are perhaps taking out some of your sleep? Because you know we do some research here on on impacts uh, from abroad, and we'd like to know your thoughts on, on what is on the pipeline. So thank you very much. Let me let me quickly start. The first question was about standard setting standard setting body of Basel Committee on Market Risk, and uh, and uh, I as you as you would expect, I agree <laughs> with what uh, the Basel Committee is putting up for consultation here. Uh, by the way, the Basel Committee only puts things up for consultation once the Basel Committee has agreed. So um, you won't get much uh, criticism from us, uh, uh, at least not from me, uh, for that. But now, with regard to reforms in Europe, and uh, I'm not a reform predictor of what's going to happen. 
uh, that's not my role. But uh, but I think we're going to have um, a set of new rules <coughs> implementing Basel, Basel, but also uh, making sure that we uh, that we have the FRTB regulation being uh, firmly in place, net stable funding ratio firmly in place, proportionality firmly in place, and I expect some ruling on capital markets, on the capital markets union too, um, because uh, the fact that we are discussing a Brexit right now means that there is even a higher need uh, in order to, to cover this topic. You do a more general answer uh, uh, regarding the uh, segmentation proportionality. Uh, as we said before, uh, Basel III in all Basel Accord uh, is to international activity banks. When we decide to, to introduce the segmentation, we observe full Basel III to the level one and we try to do a proportionality in the other buckets. Né? Uh, in the last one, uh, we go to a more simple uh, regulation framework. You know? uh, so uh, when we first implement the, the Basel uh, standard, in, I, I believe in 1994, 1995, uh, in that period, we decided to, to full implementation. Uh, the, the standard in that period was much simpler than the new one. And uh, in that period, uh, the, the Brazilian financial sector didn't have the credibility that we have today. Uh, more than that, the supervisor in that period uh, didn't have too much information in real time as we have today. No. Uh, I don't know if you know, in one year ago, uh, the Financial Stability Board uh, do a, self, uh, do a uh, peer review about the, the, the about data uh, available for Central Bank to supervise, to regulate, supervise in Brazil, and uh, we received the high level uh, assessment in that period. So since 1994, we improved too much uh, uh, how central bank get information and get information real time from the financial sector, and we improved too much uh, our supervisory process here. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have Thank you for, for both presentations. My name is André Perfeito. I'm chief economist at Gradual Investments. This is a brokerage house in Sao Paulo. And I have two questions. One is more from the theory field, and another is from the Brazilian case. What is it? Since 2008, we have been, the monetary theory is being under attack, so to speak. And they made uh, big efforts in pushing liquidity in the market, but in spite of that, we have the money multiplier in the United States, I'm not sure the numbers in, in, in Europe, below the unit. So it was around 3.5, the monetary multiplier before the crisis, now it's 0 0.97 or something like that. We are talking about increasing the efficiency of the system. If, if, if I read an old book of monetary theory, they could say that the velocity of money could, will increase in this scenario. So how do you see the, the situation with this new technology and the monetary theory, so to speak, and what can change? And in the Brazilian case, uh, we see a very big effort from Brazilian central bank, especially in the agenda BC+, it's a microeconomic agenda to improve the Brazilian system. And weeks, uh, last week, uh, I'm not sure, the Brazilian central bank cut from 40% to 25% the compulsory requirements of um, cash deposits in banks. Uh, do, do the Brazilian Central Bank have a, I don't know, um, projection, uh, a forecast of, of how these new companies in the system can cut the interest rate or the spreads? It's the, the, when you talk about compulsory, it's very little. 
in the overall spread. But do you have a forecast? So my, I want a feeling. I, I don't know if you did this kind of study with these new companies. Um, I'll be quick because you, I think you directed the first question also to me. Uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to answer this because we are living in times of extraordinary monetary policy. And this is not the normal, uh, um, normal set of things because of 2008, as you mentioned it. You know, to look at monetary multipliers, etc., etc., in times like these is a very, and, and then compare it to monetary theory, uh, is a is a daunting task. I would think. You know, what we need to do is, um, as central banks, we need to find the right moment to exit this extraordinary expansionary monetary policy first in order to have this debate. But it's worthwhile having this debate. Uh, I don't have the exact answer that you want to hear from me. Uh, as you said before, we, we have in Central Bank uh, agenda, Agenda BC+, and last week or two, two weeks ago, we did uh, one more step in this agenda no? uh, regarding in the compulsory. We have many other uh, actions that we have been done uh, since the, 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 the release of the agenda BCMIs. In order, uh, are too important as the compulsory to improve the competition and uh, to permit the financial institution uh, decrease the, the spread in Brazil. So, it is. Okay, this is our... <coughs> Thank you. I would like just to clarify a little bit more my first question because I thought it, as you guys, as you, Mr. responded, I saw that it wasn't that clear that I thought it would be. Uh, my, my idea was to ask you if you think that this giant tax, because of their international reach and economic power and structural power, infrastructure control, they can play a public role in assisting central banks and other regulators in broadening the reach and the scope of public regulations, even though they are private institutions. I will try to give an, an example. Uh, while regulators and academics are discussing whether these crypto are assets or securities or whatever, Facebook and Google might have played their, their hands in regulating these, those, as, those assets. For instance, Facebook have prohibited the advertisers for crypto assets in January this year, and Google prohibited last month. So. I think you, you, Mr. Dombert, said earlier that now today the crypto assets uh, represent a little uh, something like one percent of the international the world GDP. So this per this percentage may not grow as much as it could if those people trying to sell these assets are not able to advertise through Google or Facebook platforms. I ha you know, this gives me the opportunity to tell you my real belief about what regulation and supervision should be. We are there to describe the boundaries of what you may or may not do as a bank. We are not there to replace the marketplace. If the market wants to go through giant tax, that's their decision, has nothing to do with us. If they start going against rules, or arbitraging rules, we would go after them. But this is not, s we don't need giant techs to roll out public regulations. We, our regulations can, are direct. So if the market wants to use that, yeah, if that is a legally feasible thing to do, the market can do that. But I don't think that we should direct the market. The market should uh, develop their own opinions of what they want to do. Well, I have the same opinion, and uh, in the case of all innovation process, uh, what the central bank is doing is monitor the, the, the innovation. We don't, we don't want to enact new rules, new laws 
to prohibit or uh, prohibit the, the innovation in the financial sector. When we decide to do something, as we decided to do a new fintech, credit fintech rule, is to support the, the process of, of innovation. Okay, so uh, uh, we came to an end. I want to thank you, to thank you all for being here this morning. In particular, I want to thank to these fantastic speakers, and I think this has been a quite interesting event. Event. Thank you so much, Otavio. Thank you very much, Andreas. Adeus. Grande abraço.